uh, this means that we are attracting uh, people from other colleges and uh, this is exactly the intent of this event. Well, it didn't start this way, but it became so. Uh, so what was, I think, a college idea, a college initiative uh, smoothly uh, became something that can uh, benefit the, the university, uh, hopefully as a whole. So uh, I'm Sonia Hurt and I'm the Dean of the College of Environment and Design. For how many of you is this your first visit here? All right, so we have a healthy crowd, I would say 50-50, so uh, we are very delighted that uh, you are now part of our community. So uh, the idea of this event uh, emerged from several conversations uh, I've had with our faculty in the College of Environment and Design, uh, but also with graduate students um, and also other colleges in this university and others, and there appears to be a perpetual thirst, um, and I think a very, uh, and this is really a good thing, uh, for people to improve themselves and think how they can take their research to, to, the, to the publication end. And so um, I think there is a, a, a real need, especially for the graduate students, to get some um, better understanding of how publishing works, uh, because it's an art and not a science, and a lot of it is learned by experience, and if you have not had the experiences or you did not have many of them, ultimately you have to somehow get there. So we need to demystify the process, and we need to support people to overcome their hesitation, their fear, whatever other uh, you know, concerns they have that is actually stopping them from having the career they want. So we polled um, our own faculty, and I talked to many graduate students, and we came up with various subjects that faculty and graduate students would like help with. Um, and how to publish a book with an academic press is just one of these topics. It would be a different animal if we were talking about how to publish an edited volume. It would be a diff different animal altogether how to publish in a scientific journal which would be different than the humanities journal. It would be a different thing how you want to advance in academia through taking a leadership position. So we identified a number of areas. We had the committee, we polled people, and how to publish a book, a scholarly monograph, this is the purpose of today, with a reputable academic press was one of the topics that uh, attracted um, very strong interest from, from our faculty. So we decided that the inaugural event this year is on this uh, topic. But this is only the first of events this year. We're gonna have a second one uh, later in November um, on how to succeed in academic administration. Then we're gonna have one on journal articles and one on something else undecided in the spring. So we are trying to make this a new tradition at the college. Uh, so the college is becoming sort of an informal hub of faculty and graduate students mentoring. Uh, and we welcome your ideas of what we can talk about next time. So hopefully we run this series, not necessarily with these topics, but with similar topics. Again, how to, you know, helping you to advance in your academic career uh, for eternity. <laughs> right. Well, as long as the so. college is here. <laughs> I mean, I make small plans. So anyway, so this is where the idea came from and, and what we are hoping uh, to accomplish. So as I said initially, this was uh, initially just for the college. Uh, so I began thinking, okay, I'm gonna run the first panel, who to invite, and we'll get there in a second. Um, and then we have here, as, as, as you uh, will soon notice, some of the best minds in the field of academic publishing. And it didn't appear right that we're gonna have these really smart, energetic, awesome people and only keep the benefit to the college. So I approached my fellow deans, uh, I approached the provost, um, several other offices, and this is how this became, became a university collaborative event. And I wanna acknowledge especially the role of the vice, vice president for research, Karen Burke, um, also the dean of the uh, UGA libraries, um, and let's see, what other funder am I forgetting? Well, there is a third one, it will come to me later. But in our own college, this is sponsored by the AGOR uh, a fund, which is a firm based in Atlanta that uh, helps us with many uh, of our events. 
So, uh, oh, and the graduate school. Let us not forget because the graduate school has an internal, uh, eternal uh, desire, of course, to help the graduate students land jobs, succeed at their jobs, and so forth and so forth. So this is how this ended from a college to a university event. So I was not kidding when I said that we really do have some of the top people uh, in the country um, at this event, and I'm extremely happy and proud to, uh, to be on the same panel with them. So um, we have one of our participants by Zoom, uh, and we'll always give her the first uh, opportunity to speak, because I think it, otherwise the dynamics would be strange. Uh, so I'll interview each, so I will introduce each of the editors, starting with Beth, real quick, and then each of the editors will take this opportunity to tell you a little bit more about their interests and what they acquire books in, because like I said, uh, and this is why it's not a college, but it's a university ev uh, event, they do not necessarily solicit books uh, that are related to environment and design, although that exists as well. So generally, you know, we're talking about presses that have huge portfolios in the social sciences and humanities and the policy sciences and the legal and legal sciences as well. So it could actually apply to more people. So to, to begin with Beth, uh, here she is. Uh, larger than life, uh, uh, Beth Clevenger, who is a senior acquisition editor in environment and urbanism with a number of other topics, however, um, at MIT Press. Uh, prior to her appointment at MIT Press, she worked at Princeton Press, uh, also at McGraw-Hill, um, and being an art history major, as far as I could understand, the first job she had was actually at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. So welcome, Beth. Uh, I, uh, next time we'll have you in person. How about that? I can hear you. All right. Hi, everyone. Oh. <laughs> All right, perfect. Um, OK, so um, on the left is somebody. Let's see. No, you're not who I thought you were. So OK, so i got to switch my notes here. OK, so to my left is uh, Dr. Timothy Man uh, Manel, correct, I finally got that right, uh, who is an executive editor at the University of Chicago Press. He has a PhD uh, in geography from the University of Minnesota, and he has worked at the Chicago Press since 2013. Previously, he was at Random House, uh, also at Princeton University Press and the American Planning Association. Uh, he has consulted the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, as well as the Rockefeller Foundation, among his many other um, accomplishments. Nate uh, is uh, somebody that you can keep a very uh, close contact with, and continuously so, because he is an acquisition uh, editor at the University of Georgia Press, so he is housed very close to you. Uh, and, and I should say that I want to thank all the editors here that everyone has agreed to, if you want to have a personalized conversation about your project, we can arrange a Zoom meeting later. But it, with, with Nate, of course, um, you know, this can be done in person, I hope. Yeah, of course. And Nate, remind me, your degrees is in political science? Uh, or did I get this confused? Well, so the latest degree, the PhD is in history. In history. Yeah. All right. Okay. So we'll hear more. And Michael Magandy um, is the new, well, he's actually not until tomorrow. But <laughs> I, from I, tomorrow, I today. <laughs> from tomorrow, today, Michael is at the University of Georgia. That's what's important. <laughs> tomorrow, he will be the director of the University of South Carolina Press. And prior to transitioning, he was uh, a senior acquisition editor at Cornell Press. Uh, and I had the great uh, honor and privilege to work with Michael on one of my previous books, and uh, it turned out all right. It did. Right? So, so we have a, a, a longstanding uh, relationship. So, Michael, uh, let's see, you went to Bucknell first, and then you got your PhD uh, in philosophy, a PhD, a doctor of philosophy in philosophy. is the only real doctor there is. <laughs> That's how I see it. Um, and from Fordham University, if I correctly remember. All right, so again, we have an extremely distinguished panel uh, who are here just to be your assistants. So you're the boss. 
Uh, we're going to go through the introductions and then uh, we have selected five topics. Each of us will lead a, a short discussion and we have nearly two hours. Uh, so, you know, we're going to take as many questions as possible. And in the meantime, we have food. So, um, I, I think the food part, you are free to get to the food part anytime you want. I mean, there's not going to be we're going to stop and eat part, so you might just as well. <laughs> you know what I mean? And people can get their food when the editors are introducing themselves. But again, you know, I mean, if you want to eat later, that's fine, because it's right here. All right, so Beth, what would you like us to know about you in addition to what was just said? Well, first of all, the food hasn't arrived here, Sonia. So. <laughs> There's that. <laughs> um, well, I guess I'll just say that my remit is not focused on a single discipline, uh, like economics, which is a prior life of mine at Princeton at McGraw-Hill. Uh, now it spans environmental studies, cities and food, but the emphasis is on environmental issues. I publish books by political scientists, sociologists, geographers, historians, climate scientists, anthropologists, urban planners, philosophers, and more. So while that may seem unwieldy, uh, I do have a few organizing principles uh, that make sense of what works and what doesn't. I oversee several book series that are home to about 75, 80% of the scholarly books I publish. And then each of those has its specialization, whether it's comparative politics or global governance, environmental history, justice, food, environment, and so on. And so my relationship with those series editors um, is important and we work closely on the nature and the future of those series, uh, which will reflect and ideally advance the best work in those fields and fill the gaps in our own lists. So that's really important too. Um, how do we, I mean, we keep an eye on the best journals in the field. We talk to potential authors at conferences. Um, we keep an eye on what our peer presses are doing. Now I don't like to poach, but I do always wanna know what the other presses in my areas are doing. Um, since I'm home and I have my bookshelf right near me, I can do a little show and tell of some of the books you know, in this world. So there's um, Kian Gaw's book, Form and Flow, Spatial Politics of Urban Resilience and Climate Justice. Oh, you can't see it, but trust me, it's good. Um, and then a few more, there's Casey Hawkins, Just Housing. There's a book on the politics of the rights of nature, um, the restoration economy, uh, the arid lands. And so there really is like a, a variety of books that I look for. Um, each year, I also publish a handful of books that are meant for course use, whether it's a proper textbook or, you know, like on urban science or the energy system or green chemistry. Um, and there's always like an edited volume, maybe once per year that I publish as well. Um, and then the opposite side of my job is developing books that are meant for a broad readership. Those are really fun and they call for a very different mindset. Um, and that would call for its own panel, trade publishing. So we won't get into that today, but I think it's important for you guys to always realize that the editor that you're contacting has a lot going on. They're looking for a variety of different books. Um, and I'll just, I'll just leave it at that because I'm sure we'll get into a, a, lot, a lot more detail as it goes on. Thank you, Beth. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It's great to see you all. Um, worth the trip from Chicago already. Um, I acquire books primarily in American history uh, and books about sh the Chicago region, um, but those are only very loose guidelines. Uh, Chicago is a particularly interdisciplinary press. Um, along with Princeton, we are the, the we go back and forth with Princeton and being the largest domestic university press. We publish about 260 books a year. Uh, domestic in there is so that you don't think about Cambridge and Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a different uh, kind of thing. Um, there are about 15 people like me who acquire books in different areas. Um, and unlike a lot of presses, we're a very collaborative group. Um, there are presses where editors are very territorial. They want to kill each other. Um, but we have a very uh, deep commitment to interdisciplinarity. So we talk a lot about how books might appeal to different audiences um, or where they should be promoted or how they should be developed. Um, and figuring out a book's audience is the most central thing. Um, and it requires uh, a knowledge of your, of your original field, of course, but also a, a sense of who's going to care and why. 
Um, most presses divide their books into two categories. We divide ours into five um, because we think that there are, are lots of different ways to reach different kinds and different ranges of audience. Um, the kind of audience you have, the kind of audience you might have, goes a long way to, de to determining what your book can potentially do. And so these kinds of conversations that sound a little abstract, right, um, are nevertheless the ones that really inform what's actually happening um, in your book. So thinking about audience, thinking about voice, um, are all things that uh, any publisher brings to the process. Um, in the broadest sense, a publisher is translating your work into the marketplace. And that's the marketplace of ideas, but it's also the marketplace. And someone's got to care about someone buying your book, and that's, that's what we do. Um, so your relationship with any editor is multivalent, it's ongoing, um, it requires a lot of conversation, a lot of trust, um, and so the process of finding the right home for your book um, is not, not one to be done lightly. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right. Um, yeah, so I am with the University of Georgia Press, right? And so if you haven't heard of us, you've heard of us now. Our <laughs> offices are on the third floor of the main library, so just across the street. Um, and you can come see us anytime. Um, after the national championship game, people heard that there was a press and they thought we were the people that were, were printing the newspapers. They could buy commemorative news. It's not. Um, so anyways, uh, so we, University of Georgia Press is the oldest and largest publisher in the state of Georgia. Um, we have been publishing books since 1938 uh, and we publish, um, between 70 and 80 books per year. Um, and and like, like everyone here, uh, and the two presses you're representing, two-ish, <laughs> one and a half, um, zero, zero. Uh, we, we've of course published scholarly monographs, right? And most of what I acquire in is history. That's my, my own sort of uh, academic training. Um, but we also publish uh, a series on sociology, a series on geography, um, mostly emphasizing race and ethnicity as, as sort of the connective tissue there. Um, and of course, what we're probably most well known for is, is Southern history, as far as, as far as history goes, but we also publish Caribbean history, uh, Latin American history, all, you know, history writ large. Um, but one of the other things that the University of Georgia Press is, is pretty well known for is publishing things for folks beyond the academy, right, or beyond, beyond monographs. So we have a, a pretty robust uh, creative nonfiction list, um, which includes awards, the, the Flannery O'Connor Award for short fiction, um, the Sue Williams Silverman Prize, which is from, the, from AWP, the Association of Writers and Writing Programs. Um, poetry we publish, and we also publish quite a bit of regional trade, which is um, anything from guidebooks, right? Day hikes in North Georgia. You want to figure out where to hike in North Georgia, we got a book for you. Um, to, and I, I did bring a book because it was co-authored by a couple of colleges and environment and design <coughs> folks, right? And this is my copy with bookmarks and sticky notes in it so I can figure out what the heck is going to grow in the shade on the east side of Athens. Um, so we publish books like this too. Right, so there we do we do a little bit of everything, and I think we do it we do it pretty well. So, huh. um, over to Michael. You do do it pretty well. Oh, thank um, you. Thank you. Um, I, I think I'll talk more about Cornell, where I was, and where I'm going to be. I've not yet had a formal meeting with my staff, so I think it'd be premature um, to say anything about what uh, the University of South Carolina Press might be acquiring that would pertain to this audience. Though I will just put an asterisk and say, maybe Southern urbanism. You didn't hear that, <laughs> um, but that, that, that's to be determined. But thinking about Cornell University Press, so I have left, but I left my lists, and they're being picked up by other people. So the, the publishing program continues. Editors come in, and like, all of us have been, eventually you bounce around. But we've, we've all been different places at different times, and lists endure. They are attached at different times to individual editors, um, but oftentimes, particularly if you create a successful list, it passes on to someone else and it has its own integrity that's independent of the personality of the person who started or made it flourish or tried to kill it and unsuccessfully <laughs> tried to kill it. Um, so at Cornell, 
Um, we, I think the hallmark of our urban built environment landscape architecture design sort of list is in that it has a mixed methods aspect to it, which is to say that you may be collecting data, you may be working on high concept, um, you may be in a kind of social scientific mindset, but you're going to be asked to write something that has a historical basis. You're going to be asked to write a narrative telling the story of concept or data and not just go completely high-minded or completely quantitative. Um, and that has, can have some limitations for some authors. It can be a great strength to the analysis. Um, I would say the great strength is that it makes your data or your analysis palatable because you're telling a story in addition to sharing data, right? Um, and you know, echoing um, something that Tim was highlighting implicitly in what he was saying and anticipating something that I'm gonna be talking about just in a few minutes when we think about a proposal is that knowing the press is incredibly important and every press does have an identity. So I think for Cornell, this mixed methods, bringing history into it in some important way is part of its identity. If you don't wanna do it, you don't wanna work with Cornell, right? Um, you wanna go somewhere else um, and that will shape your early ideas about what you wanna be doing. Um, those identities do also change, right? It could change because someone leaves. Um, it could change because someone assesses the marketplace and says, that identity was a failure. And we need to do something else and change who we are. So you always need to check in. The backlist, you know, what you can see online and is the visible face of what the press has been representing may not be what's coming in the next two or three years. And the best place to know what the pipeline, what we call the pipeline is, is to go to your professional meetings, talk with the editor and ask the editor, you know, what, and, and put it mildly, right? You don't want to say, what's your pipeline and how many titles are in it and how will you divide it? You'd say, what are you excited about that's coming out in the next two, three, four, five years? Um, that's a polite way to elicit that kind of information about where the press is headed, not where it's been, because there are always turning points. There's always decisions. Thinking about where Cornell is right now with the transition, um, the list in urbanism now is entirely, um, and I'm using urbanism as a kind of a broad catch-all for um, for this work is, is in the, on the desk of uh, Jim Lance. Um, and as everyone here has also talked about sort of what they're acquiring, right, they're in one area, but they're in a few others. They're very seldom one person just in one area. Um, I was doing work in history principally and with a lot of focus on New York State regional topics. So um, that influenced what I was looking for within the profession more generally. What Jim is working in is sociology, anthropology. That will shape you know, what he's looking for within the general discipline. Clearly skew it in a slightly more um, social scientific way rather than historical way. Um, but there still, I think, prevails a certain notion of the Cornell book. And the Cornell book is kind of at the intersection of, of, of quantitative and qualitative or historical. Um, so I think that that's, at least as I can see it now, now on the outside and between things, um, where the press is like the list is likely to be for the next two, three, four years. Um, so that's information for you, just sort of profiling Cornell as a press. And I would simply say, you know, regarding South Carolina, watch that space. Um, it could be interesting. It could be valuable to you. It could be meaningless to you. I can't tell you right now. All right. Thank you. Um, so um, let's see. So the idea here, like uh, um, I mentioned earlier, is that we, based on our experiences, have identified five broad topics. So we're going to begin this way, and then if there are questions, we'll just, uh, you know, interject them. So, Michael. Tell us about the common process of putting together a book proposal. And I think actually, I mean, I would imagine, especially for the graduate students, we are talking about the first book. So it's also important to know what is a book proposal. A book proposal is not necessarily the whole book. So actually, we're going to be talking about the book prospectus, most commonly called, and what part of the book can become part of the uh, uh, part of the initial submission to a press of your choosing, so. so uh, I'll, I'll speak to some fundamental aspects of process and the thing itself. Um, there's no way within the compass of what this is that I can, you can have a full workshop, you can have a full day, it would bore you to tears, it could still be important. Um, there are books out there, there are tons of books. Punch it up. I just lost my phone, excuse me. 
um, there are lots of books that will walk you through the process and all the bits and pieces. Also, I'm going to share with you my guidelines for proposals. All of us have mm -hmm. guidelines that you can look at. They, they are remarkably similar, and they have very small, subtle differences, which are important to note in terms of profiling, which press you're going to. So the, the, the mechanics are out there and available in many forms. Um, and I'm not going to go through the whole every bit of the proposal, because it's just there's not, not the right thing right now. But I would say this about the process and about the thing itself. It is clearly a, conden a, a condensed presentation of the work to come. It covers key areas that range from the big ideas to the minutia of how many pages or words. Um, it is meant to turn your work and or inform an editor who, as Tim, I think, aptly put it, is your mediator between substance and marketplace. And our role, we're, we're gatekeepers in certain respects in terms of the academy, but we're also first readers, and we need to know that your work is going to fit into a marketplace, both of ideas and a dollars and cents world. So the proposal is also doing that sort of work. So it's your table of contents. It's why in the world would anyone want to read this book? It's how does it change other minds or discourses within fields. It's how many pages, how many illustrations. It's what's already been published before, <laughs> and can you clear the rights <laughs> um, or not. Um, it's what's your schedule for production. It's also if this is a revised dissertation, and, and you know a lot of people in the audience right now clearly are at that juncture in their professional lives. Um, you know, how does it relate to the dissertation? Is it taking out the word dissertation and then sending it? Not advisable, but it happens. Or is it a radical rewrite with great new research and what have you and is really its own thing? So it covers all, all of these sorts of things and, and a bio of yourself, um, professional bio of yourself. So it, it has all those elements and it is something that you should prepare with the understanding that it will be sent to an editor cold. No smiles, no handshakes, no introductions, no schmoozing. It's got to stand on its own. It's got to be interesting on its own, and it can't expect any personal favors. One of the most important things about a proposal is that you don't want to be in that situation. <laughs> you want to have an introduction. You want to have a handshake. You want to be introduced by someone that will force the editor, who loves to say no and wants to get stuff off of their desk, to take, pay attention and not compulsively reject your work because it's more work and the person doesn't want to do more work. So having a senior colleague who will say, I'd like to introduce you to my junior colleague who's doing really wonderful work and really I know you have half an hour to talk. That is really important for making sure that that proposal isn't just cold. Um, and you should do everything you can to, if you're starting a conversation with an editor, to make it interpersonal and to make it collegial because um, that sets you up for success. But in doing your proposal, you have to presume that you're not going to have those benefits. Um, and you need to have, make sure that it represents the work on its own and helps the editor. Um, so generalities. A couple things I just want to highlight. Tim's looking at me skeptically. I'm, I'm going to argue with almost everything you've said so far. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, here. <laughs> Specifics would be and I was having some conversations earlier today uh, in this regard. The proposal is obviously a way in which you're thinking through your work, and you may, in the course of making, creating your proposal, not feel like this is absolutely the right thing or absolutely what you want to do. You may feel it's still exploratory in some ways, or you can't solve certain issues, some dilemmas of construction, market, what have you. In the proposal, you need to be specific and you need to be detailed. You need to make a choice. You don't want to have a proposal where you have plan A, B, and C presented to the editor. The editor does not want a range of options. The editor wants a plan. If it's interesting, the editor will engage with you on that plan, and you may well move in the course of conversation to your B or your C. But if you lay out multiple plans all at one time, it's confusing. It suggests, again, cold, that you don't know what you want to do, and you're asking someone to figure it out for you. Um, and an editor's job oftentimes does turn out to be the sort of person who's a conversation partner or helping figure out what you want to do, but one does not want to see that initially. It also confuses what am I criticizing, right? So you plant your project in one place, 
make that the gambit for conversation and be open to changing sorts of things. And that comes, you know, that, that speaks to, you know, what conversations in the academic world do you want to change and you want to contribute to, to literally how many words are going to be in the book, right? So all the details need to be in place. We understand that they're revisable, but you shouldn't, again, be, to borrow some words from peanuts, you shouldn't be wishy-washy in your proposal. You should be definite, clear, and specific. Um, and then open the conversation. Um, the other aspect of a really good proposal is, um, or in some sense the fundamental, I think the fundamental function of the proposal is to, um, the bar of the words or the title of what I think is one of the better books, even though it is quite dated now, um, that guide people working with the publishing process is Thinking Like Your Editor. Um, and that's a book by um, Rabiner and, and Fortunato um, by, from W.W. Norton a long time ago, and I think it still holds up because the fundamental idea is knowing that, and going back to Tim, you know, what a proposal does is shift you into a marketplace and away from the academy in certain ways. It begins with the reader and not with the research question, right? Because we all care about the research question, but if it doesn't pay out on the back end with the reader, I can't do it. We can't do it. Um, and a good proposal begins with a rationale, I think. Um, and the rationale is why in the world does anyone care? Which is ultimately why will there be books sold? Which will be why will we make enough money at least to break even? Which is why can we keep the lights on, right? So all those things connect. Um, so in putting together your proposal, if you put it together in a really good way that is in the modality of thinking like your editor, one, it helps us do our jobs really well. It doesn't require us to translate your work into marketplace, you start doing that for us. It also shows that you respect what we do and you understand what we do, right? Like, I know you're doing this thing that is different than what I do. I know what function you provide. I know you're a gatekeeper, but also you're a liaison to marketplace. And I'm doing everything I can to give you the information you need in order to do your job well. Um, and that suggests not only are you helping me do my work, and I appreciate that, right, because that takes work off my desk, but it also suggests to me that you're going to be a good partner. Right, you're going to understand your role. You're going to understand my role. We can have a respectful relationship where we work together in our different capacities. And you're not just treating me as a gatekeeper, like the thing between you and the brass ring that you want, which is the publishing contract and all of that. But really, it is a collaborative endeavor um, where we both have different interests, different expertise, and can work together. So that, that makes me feel good about things and, and allows me to feel very confident in that. So, I think that's another aspect of the proposal. And the third I would just highlight, and it goes back to you know, sort of profiling or researching presses, is that you'll likely draft a proposal that has all the elements that I just described in it and, and any reasonable guidelines would tell you you need to have. Um, and then once you have something like a firm idea of what you think you may want to do, you're then going to start researching presses. Right, because until you have a clear idea, you don't really know what press it's going to fit into. Now you have a firm but still provisional idea. You're going to look at presses, and I would encourage you to think in threes, as in no more than three. Um, if you're thinking more than three likely presses, you probably haven't clarified your ideas well enough yet. Um, if you only have one press, I mean, maybe that's your dream press, and you're welcome to have one press. But if your thing only works for one press, then it might be still a little too idiosyncratic. So think in terms of three limited field of options. Once you have that, then you go back and revise the proposal, think about the press, right? What are the books they've published recently that speak to your work? What are you building on that they've done before? Does that change your table of contents? Does that change your rationale? And you may wind up with if you're getting at this sort of serious phase, like there are three presses I really want to talk to, you may have three different variants on the proposal, thinking about the three different presses. Um, when you have a proposal, oftentimes you have a section that's called comparable books. Um, and, and, and you typically, if you're pitching to a press, you want to have at least one of their books in there, <laughs> in your comparables. Um, it's, it might be fluff, it might be just a gesture, but it's good to do that. I suggest you did some research in terms of the catalog. Um, there is no problem within your comparables of having books that are not with the press that you're pitching to. And actually, it's a useful thing because then it shows that your interests and, your, and, your, and the work you're doing are fitting into a larger field of, of study and analysis. Um, the one thing you absolutely want to make sure is that if you come up with three different variants or two different variants, is that you make sure you hand the right proposal to the right editor. And you don't have the proposal that 
has all the nomenclature from Cornell when you pitch to Chicago, which, I mean, it all happens all the time. In most cases, we laugh, and we may look beyond it, because we know how it happened, right? Mm -hmm. And we, we, we send out mass emails, and we do silly things like that, too, right? But all the same, it's not a good look, right? So if, if, if you're, you're going to create variants, just, just, just take a very careful look at your variants and make sure that you haven't all the language that needs to be changed has been changed appropriately. Um, so that's what I have to say. I am very eager to know why Tim thinks I'm all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but not all wrong. Not, not all. Sixty-six <laughs> percent. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> um, does uh, anyone want to uh, engage in a conversation first, bet on this subject? Yeah. Oh, see, there's so much we could say here. Uh, I think I'll start with the idea of the proposal not being homework, like take your time with it and it will reintroduce you to your project in a way that can be very constructive. And it's not a throwaway document. So when I get a good proposal and I end up moving forward with it, a book project, um, I find myself returning to it. You know, I look to it for the comparable books, for what the author originally identified. So it's not a waste of your time, take your time with it. Um, in terms of doing the research for the presses, do kind of pick up the maybe five books that you consider to be the most comparable to yours and look and see who published it, right? And, and they should be very recent because like we've just heard, you know, a press can change directions. Um, the last thing I'll say that I have an issue with is while I do welcome introductions, that's great. I don't require them. Um, Plenty of, I mean, thousands of emails, to be perfectly frank, come in, and I have more emails than I can really field, but plenty of the books that I acquire do come in over email, and usually they start with a very succinct inquiry. So there's not a proposal attached to it yet. It's a, it's a succinct inquiry, like expressing interest, saying what the book is about, quite briefly, of course, what's novel, and why they want to publish with MIT Press. Now, Usually, you know, like I would say include my assistant who, who can help me keep track of a lot of these things too. And if you don't hear from an editor, you always email back. Um, I will be perfectly honest. I've come across inquiries uh, like from a year, a year and a half ago, bashfully written back being like, hey, this actually seems like a, a promising project. You might've found a publisher by now, but maybe not. So I don't know, maybe that helps you also get a sense for when you should feel hopeless and when you should not. But it also is why you should reach out to those top three presses that really would be the best for your book. Okay. Thank you, Beth. Uh, I just want to pose a question. So maybe this is an obvious question, but what would you say, what would be the answer to this question? Complicated. At what point of time do I write my proposal? So should I wait for the whole book to be done or 80% or 20% or, and I, I know it depends, but maybe it's a practical consideration to keep in mind. You want to go with that? <laughs> um, it, the thing about these kinds of panels is that we get lots of very specific questions, <laughs> and the answer is always it depends. Um, and that's frustrating, I know. Um, <laughs> but you know, people will ask, What's, when should I send you my materials? And the answer is when they're ready. <laughs> um, you know, what, what do you want to read? Well, I want to read something good, right? So it, it is, uh, it's vague, it's open-ended, but that's because the whole process is conversational, right? So what you're doing in, in anything you send at any point is trying to initiate a conversation. And that might be really, really early, right? I'm two years away from defending, but here's what I'm thinking of doing, and I really loved this book that, that you just published, should we talk someday? Okay, that's, a, that's one conversation. Another conversation is, I defended, I'm on the job market, I need a book contract immediately, can you help me? Right, that's a different kind of conversation. Uh, I defended five years ago, I finally got around to writing my book proposal. Uh, I'm not sure if it's any good, but I have 800 pages of text. Would you like to look at them? Right? These are all things that happen, right? Um, the biggest, the biggest thing that made me squinch my face at what, at what Michael was saying is that your, it's not your job to make our jobs easy. Right? 
Our job is to help you. And so wherever you are is where we start the conversation. Right? Now, you may be way off from where we want you to be, <laughs> right, or where you need to be. But moving, you know, if, you're, if your project shows promise, if you're doing something interesting, we're going to work with you to get you to the place where you can actually publish the book you want to publish, right? Um, and that, how that results will be a, a product of the vision that we develop together, right? You come in with a vision, we come in with a vision and some of the realities of publishing, and between us, we figure out where is, where is the best, what is the best product for this, what is the best home for this, how is this going to work? And at any point along the process, we may say this isn't going to work, right? And you have, to, you have to try somewhere else, right? But while we do say no all the time, I mentioned in a meeting internally the other day that I reject something every day. And my colleagues said, only one? <laughs> <laughs> the volume, um, Beth alluded to this, the volume of stuff we get is enormous. But that's not your problem, right? Your problem is to break through that and to say, look what I've got. You know, here's something really interesting. Here's why it's really well suited to your press. Here's why you know, we, should, we should be starting this conversation. My fundamental feeling is that editors want to say yes to things. I think that there's this cultural idea that you know, editors and other gatekeepers sit there going, ha, no, no, are you kidding me? No. <laughs> And you know there are times when like when, when something really off base comes in that is hilarious, um, but uh, most of the time we're opening emails and, and looking at projects, hoping to find something exciting, right? Because we like to publish books, um, and so it's it should be a more positive. Um, let's work through this together. You know, even if your proposal is premature or overwritten or has something weird going on in it. Um, you know, let's, let's work through it. Excellent. Nate? Yeah, so I know we have a few questions planned on proposals, so I don't want to go too um, deep here, but there, there are a few things I'll, I'll say. One is that proposals do different things at different presses, yeah. right? So whenever you're researching a press or approaching a press or emailing an editor, say, I have an idea, let's, can we talk? Um, it's important for you all to understand what, when you're talking about submitting a proposal to a press, what it's doing. Is it the first step to them, to a particular editor or press saying, I'd like to see the manuscript, right? Which it is at some presses. Uh, at UGA Press, we put projects under contract after a proposal and the sample chapter gets reviewed. That doesn't happen everywhere, right? So you need to, as you're writing, and figuring out where you're gonna um, submit a proposal, you need to sort of have that um, figured out, or at least be prepared to ask that question. Um, so that's the, the sort of caveat that goes with all the things that I'm about to say. Um, what I tend to tell folks who get in touch with me to introduce their project without having sent the proposal, or they send the proposal and say, can we talk, or we talk at a book exhibit, um, is that a proposal is a very particular genre of writing, right? That you really only do for proposals. It's, it's, uh, so what, you're, what a proposal, what I tell folks that they're trying to do when they write a proposal is, you are trying to give an editor and potentially uh, a set of peer reviewers an idea of what the full book is going to look like without having written the full book, right? Which is like a Zen cone, one hand clap. You can't do it, but you have to do it. Um, and so that's sort of the first thing to, to, that you have to think about, right? Is that you are planning a book without having, writing it, without having written it, which is, in the most cases, which, comes, which becomes especially important for dissertation to book books, but we'll talk about that uh, more a bit later, I think. Um, and the other thing I tell folks when they're thinking about sending me a proposal or they send me one is that just precisely what everyone is saying here is that don't think of this as a pass-fail thing, right? Where, you, where what you're sending me has to be perfect right away. You send it to me and it's the, hopefully the start of a conversation, right? I will read it, I will tell you if I think something's missing, or I will tell you if 
I'm excited about it, but I didn't get excited until the second page, which is a problem with the proposal, right? So it's the, for me, it's the start, hopefully, uh, of a conversation. And I'll sort of stop there, because I'm sure we'll do more proposal talk here. Uh, perfect, so um, a follow-up question is, what would make a good proposal? What are you looking for, Tim? Uh, well, <laughs> we're looking to be excited, right? We're looking to, we're looking to be interested. Um, we read lots of proposals, we read lots of books. Um, and that's good in that you know, we know fields, we understand discourses, but it also means that we get bored, right? We've heard this before, right? This is, this is a well-known subject. And so what, we're, what, makes a, what makes a good proposal is something that shows grounding and engagement in a field, but also recognizes what hasn't been done, right? Not, not in a like crazy, no one's ever thought about this before, right? <laughs> that's, that's pretty rare. People have thought of a lot of things. Right? Um, but no one's ever taken this approach to this subject. No one's ever tried to, I, I did a book recently that tried to bring together uh, architecture and, and um, Austrian school economics, right? And I looked at that and thought, I definitely have not seen that book before. <laughs> um, those, those kinds of things help a lot, right? That we understand quickly what makes this work. Um, to give you just a little sense of some of the inter internal processes, when I'm explaining to my colleagues in the other editors and people in marketing um, why we should do a book and what's exciting about it and what readers think about it and so forth, I write a memo that's maybe three single space pages. That gets boiled down at some point for a memo for a board, which is about one to one and a half single space pages. That gets boiled down to three paragraphs of jacket copy. That gets boiled down to three bullet points for the sales reps who are out in the world trying to actually get that sold. And of those three, they usually get out about half of one. So your book has to work on all of those levels. There has to be the three-page explanation of why it's important and what it engages with and what fields are in and all of that. But there also has to be the bullet points, right? And if you can't do it in bullet points, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Because people don't buy books on the basis of three-page essays. They might get there, but they're going to start with the bullet points. And so we need to know in the proposal pretty quickly, what is this about? Why are you the person to, to, to write it? And what's, what's the payoff of this going to be? Um, in the most general sense, that's what makes for a good, a good, uh, a good proposal. Perfect. So I'll transition to Beth, uh, if she can tell us what are things to avoid in a book proposal. And then we're going to get some questions for you from, from, from the audience. So, Beth? Yeah. So, uh, Tim, that was perfect. That was well said. Uh, and what to avoid? So, I have a couple of things that really kind of stick in my craw when I read a proposal. The comparable book section. I find that that's usually the weak link and a source of frustration. So, um, you know, don't provide a list of books that are not comparable. Your book might become canon, but don't work. Don't list the, the great works in your field. Um, influential books are very different from comparable books. So while you're welcome to include a list of those influential books, maybe at the end, because that can inform the editor's understanding of like your thought process, your aims, your inspiration, um, that's extra. Like, so in this case, right, this is a first book for most of you. Most of the comparable books should also be first books. And the publication date matters. So they should have been published within say the last three years. Um, at least that's what happens at MIT Press. Uh, when I take a book forward and we talk about it, when I present it to our publishing committee, recent comps are really all that anyone cares about because even though publishing almost has like the same issues over and over for decades, it does change a lot. And so they want recent examples. Um, and again, this is not a waste of your time. Like a thorough and realistic list really helps the editor understand who the book is for, how it's moving the field forward. Um, 
you know, what researchers and, and at people at what meetings are going to want to read it. It'll help our marketing team, of course. Um, so, yeah. And then a similar mistake actually is made with the audience question. Rarely is a book for fellow scholars and the general public interested in these issues. Um, you know, the, uh, the groups come with a totally different set of knowledge, different expectations for detail and language, for narrative, citations, for extrapolations and prescriptions, like they want very different things. So this comes down to really being clear and realistic about what you want to write, who it's for, and because that's going to inform, you know, every single sentence that you write in that book. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so um, Nate and I have our own sections, but uh, we want to be more uh, uh, collaborative here. So let's take some questions uh, from the audience about, well, the essence, the must and must not of a book proposal. Uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. So uh, in, in terms of identifying, you know, let's say three, three presses, and you may have slight variations, you know, understanding presses that are somewhat different. Um, so that is it considered uh, bad etiquette to just send it out to three presses at the same time, or should you send it to one press, wait? Um, so what I, what I generally tell authors is, first, you should be talking to more than one press, right? And you don't just, don't just talk to me, right? Um, so that's one, but the etiquette, the, the sort of, headline of the etiquette that I ask authors is if you are talking to more than one press, just keep me, keep me in the loop, right? I want to know if, if some other press has offered you a contract already. Because we, you know, when we send stuff out for peer review, we pay for peer reviewers, right? We are investing in the project at that early stage, right? So being apprised of what's happening is sort of the, the baseline of the etiquette that, that I ask for. Oh, I see. Okay, um, so I just need to repeat questions that come from the audience. So Wade's question was, uh, is it routine to communicate simultaneously with several book publishers? And the answer was yes. The recommended number of presses to be in contact at the same time while keeping them all informed is three. So here we actually got to a number in a panel. That's unheard of. And I will say some presses too don't want simultaneous, you know, if they right. find out. So. Right. Yeah, I mean, every, every press will tell you on their website, you know, and, and if they say they don't want simultaneous submission, you better, you need to take them at their word because they will be punitive about it. Um, we are not that way. We're, we're, we're like Georgia. Um, <laughs> you know, um, just keep people informed and give everybody a fair chance, right? So we send something out for review. Minnesota sends something out for review. Minnesota offers you a contract. You don't come back to me and say, hey, Minnesota offered me a contract and I signed it. You come back to me and say, Minnesota signed me, offered me a contract. What are you going to do? Mm. Right? Now's the time. Mm. Right? Um, and you balance it out from there. So it takes a little diplomacy. It takes a little extra work on, on your part to make sure that everyone feels you know, like, the, like the, that we're on a level playing ground. Um, but it certainly is not uncommon and certainly at the earlier stages you should you should be talking with as many people as you can right and I, would, I would add that that transparency it's respect for us but also the diplomacy that goes with it is going to be very good for you because if everything is going well in your professional life there's probably going to be another project that right. maybe for another press that a, a respectful development of a project and signing a contract with another press were a reasonable rationale, not that you need to explain yourself strongly to an editor that you leave behind, but you know, I like this, this, and this is why I made my choice. You, your next book, the person that, that person is really good to work with, and I was really sorry I didn't get to do their first book because it turned out to be a prize winner, blah, 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 but I know this person is really good and good to work with, and that negative moment, because it was handled so well, becomes a real positive for you. We're, we are all in this together um, over a very long haul. Rosanna? So I, I found very useful the explanation about the three page review that was fascinating. Uh, and we have, I'm not sure, a few PhD students uh, in one of those stages that we described. So, how 
for somebody that is coming fresh, you know, writing or studying <laughs> a dissertation, how similar is how similar is that proposal of writing to the one that you are expecting? Uh, Secondly, for the dissertation versus. Um, I, I need to repeat the question for the record. So, so your question is how similar is a book proposal to a prospectus, dissertation prospectus? Yeah, exactly. I mean, whatever they don't do. Yeah, uh, okay. Somebody, I mean, we actually have a separate uh, heading here to talk about dissertations to books. Yeah, we'll get, we'll get but, to that. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. I mean, in, in a way, um, in, if, I, if I might interject myself just for a second, um, Again, the it depends thing really applies, but here's my advice as an author and not an editor. Um, so at what point, if you're writing your dissertation or if you're writing a book after your dissertation, do you send the proposal? It depends, but here's how I do it. If you're a relatively inexperienced author, which is every graduate student, um, before I send my book proposal, I would have expected of myself to have written most of it. Experienced writers later in the career can probably write the book proposal be before they have a book. Um, but so I, I, I really think this is crucial. I mean, in my personal experience, the first time I tried to get the book contract, I had the whole thing. But now, since I've done this a couple of times, I feel comfortable sending three chapters. And some very reputable uh, presses, we don't have them here at the moment, but for example, the University of North Carolina Press, actually would consider give advanced contracts for just uh, uh, the proposal and a chapter. Yeah, so, do we. so it varies widely. Again, you have to work with the press, but it, it's not just a question of when the press would accept the proposal, because they don't need to know what stage you are. I mean, of course, you should be honest. But also how comfortable you are sending a proposal, because like in my case, if I don't have the first three chapters, then I actually am not quite sure what I'm going to say. So I don't want to put a proposal together and say something which I know may actually not happen. I might really deviate from the subject. So for me, I need to have some comfort. And again, if you're a very inexperienced author, I think you need to have more of the body of the text done before you can actually pledge um, with a proposal. Because again, the proposal is not a contract in the sense like, oh my god, you deviated. That's the end of it. But still, you've kind of made a promise that you're going to deliver on this. And if you're going to actually eventually send a manuscript that is completely divorced from your proposal, the editor can come back and say, oh, it's just not the same project. So you know, it, it takes a little, it's, there is no yes or no in what is the right stage. But the short answer, in my opinion, between the dissertation perspectives and the book proposal, it, there's a wide distance, lots of daylight. To some, uh, in my mind, of the study, there are certain uh, book series, mm -hmm. uh, and the editors of the series are scholars in, in our history. If we were told that our, our dissertation project is going to be a book project, that would be extended uh, into what we have in addition to a, ser a series. Is it that we would um, reach out to the editor of that, like the, the, the scholar in our discipline who is editing that series? Would we reach out to that person first to confirm that? Would we, or no, that's not how that works. The press determines whether or not a book proposal is, would fit into a, a book series. I, mean, I guess, how do you, have, what comes first with that? Or again, is it just as it depends? I just need to repeat the question. So the question is, um, many presses have a series. And these series uh, have a serious editor who is usually a regular faculty member as opposed to being a senior acquisition editor. So if you're specifically interested in a series, which is sometimes is really good because series is, they come with a lot of prestige. If, you know, this particular press has a series in, well, Southern urbanism, you know, it's the only one in the country, then maybe this is where I should go. Do you contact the editor of the series who's a faculty member, or do you contact a generic acquisition editor and they make the connection? In, in the forest of publishing, there are many paths. <laughs> um, uh, so we have a series, Historical Studies of Urban America. Um, and 
often people have come across those scholars at conferences or you know, one way or another, and so they have some basis for starting a conversation, um, and that's fine. That's, you know, if, if, if they feel that that's uh, something appropriate to talk to the press about, then they bring it to me. Um, but conversely, I meet people or people would write to me uh, cold, and if it seems like, gosh, this certainly seems like a historical study of ur urban America, um, I will alert the editors and say, do you want, is this a conversation you want to have? So both ways. Yeah. It can work. And, and I, would, I would add to that, and this pertains to working with series, but also everything in certain respects, crucial conversations when you're getting down to your three, which could be four, could be two, but the three thing, um, is talking with authors who you know who have recently published with that editor or that house. Um, because that'll give you a good feel about how it works and thinking about series. I think a healthy series is one where the series editors are the principal readers and then come to the editor. I feel that way as an editor. Um, it's also one of the reasons why we have series is that make right. have, have some of that work off of our desk at least initially. But I also I finished um, an interim phase handling another series which will not be named where the series editors are even more negative than me, Tim. They're really negative, um, and they're really tough, and they're really demanding. And I had people coming to me knowing that, saying, this is my proposal, and I would help them armor it <laughs> against the anticipated criticism of the series editors to come. Um, so there was a way in which I understood the culture of the series, and I helped the, the authors because they want to be in this series, in the series, right? So even, even if it's a miserable experience, they want that. Um, and the uh, series editors are excellent, but they are tough. Um, I, I helped them, and they only knew sort of to come to me because they knew from other people how demanding the critical process was. But, you, but the, the, the authors who have worked with in-house editors or worked with series editors are the ones um, are usually the most reliable conversation partners for what's really happening. Um, behind the scenes. Uh, Beth, uh, we want to give you the opportunity to respond if you have something. No, I agree with what's been said. I do like it when people approach series editors first because they can have those um, just more in-depth conversations and the series editor usually has a very good idea whether or not it's something that would work. Um, but yes, I have definitely received inquiries over the transom where I thought, oh, this actually looks like a good project for X series and I'll forward it on. Um, and the added benefit to uh, publishing in the series is that you get even more input, right? Most of my series editors that I've developed, right, they provide more shaping and they will give more input also early on and then say, hey, you know, either do this work or don't, but this is what we're looking for for the series. You might want to take it elsewhere. Um, this is a good opportunity for me to say, too, at MIT Press, I'm one of those presses who prefers to have um, a full draft of a scholarly manu uh, manuscript. Uh, and that's not just for first books. Uh, books like this, execution is everything. So you can say what you want the proposal and I might be incredibly excited about it and think it looks great. But until I have that manuscript that proves it and that I can send out for a very productive review, you know, it, it means less. So, but again, of course there are exceptions. I've definitely proceeded with a, a couple of sample chapters before, but one more time where all the uh, publishing houses differ, sorry. Yes. So when you approach a press, do you guys prefer the one pager first or the uh, full proposal? Uh, I know that Beth just said we probably should have the full manuscript sitting behind us for going to MIT. Uh, okay, so the question is, should you have a one pager or a 20 page proposal? And obviously in some cases, the full manuscript. An initial contact. I mean, I would say my answer is like initial contact. You don't have to have anything. Just open the conversation. But let's let's hear from the editors. Uh, so <laughs> it depends. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't mind a, a quick email with the, this is what my project is about. Do you want to hear anything else about it? Both because it's it's easier for me to say. Yeah, sure, send me the proposal, I'd love to read it. Or to say, no, nah, you might try this press and this press, right? And it's probably better for you too, you don't invest the, that extra time in. But that's, that's just me. 
Um, and it, it's going to depend, even at UGA Press, depend on which editor you send it. So you, I guess what I would say is the one page, two paragraph introductory email is never a bad idea. But it's in your interest to have done the proposal. Sure, sure. Because if the response is, oh, I'm sure, I want to hear more, yeah. you don't want to say, okay, I'll get back to you in a year. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the, back, the back and forth. And you build a relationship by doing things, right? Yeah. I mean, so good idea. Well, let's do something together. And you say, well, there, there's really nothing we can do together for three years. Well, <laughs> well then the relationship just collapses. But if, you know, oh, it's a good idea for two paragraphs. Let's see if it's a good idea for 10 single space pages. And then, you know, depending on where you are and all that, if you're working with MIT, you know, then it's, show me five chapters. Then maybe you want to show me the whole. So being able to go back and forth a few times, um, one, it forwards the process, but it also deepens the relationship through common action and, right. and refining common goals. And I'd like to add that, you know, I don't mind when these conversations do span years. You know, there might be initial inquiry, I say, sounds great, or, you know, let's keep in touch. And if you don't have something to show or if life intervenes and you get back to me in a couple of years of the project, that's great. You know, like that's that's really fine. We're not publishing, you know, we're not journalists. So if you need to take more time on, on what you're working on, good. And yeah, the relationship can continue. If I might interject again from my own experience, so how much should you have? Um, enough that it's defendable. So yes, I will not open a conversation if I, my idea is not clear, because then I'll appear silly. Um, but whether you have the manuscript, making the decision for yourself, and of course a lot depends on the press. I mean, there are some people that are so committed to their idea, and maybe they have more experience, that like, they, this is going to be my book. I am not actually going to do a lot of changes. That, that, that's what this project is about, I feel very strongly, so I actually don't care to get any intermediate input after the first chapter, after the second chapter, three chapters or whatever. Um, and there are people who work the other way, and I'm in this category in which I actually want to get some preliminary input because it would make the whole of the project, in my opinion, better at the end. So I would actually rather send three chapters to get some comment and then send the, the full manuscript. But there are some people who are like, no, I, you know, that, that's my story, I'm sticking to it, and whether they say something in the middle or not is not going to change my story. So I think that it also depends on you and not only the press of, of which approach you will, you will take. But a, but a good way to alienate the press from the beginning is to say, here's my book, love yeah. it or leave it. <laughs> They'll probably leave it. <laughs> yes. I'm not saying it can't work. Well, first of all, I wanted to say thank you for everything. Um, I know a lot of this information is available um, on your websites, but also there's so much that you said that is just helpful in here that isn't there. So I thank you. Um, and I also uh, I want to actually pose a question that was really good. That was. Um, what are you most excited about for publishing in the next two, three, four years? And maybe narrow it down as it relates to landscape architecture, architecture, political sciences, or something. So the question is to Michael about South Carolina or Cornell? I think all of us. All, uh, all of us, okay, okay. What are you going to be really excited about to publish about in the next few years? I think Beth wants to start on that one. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now you want to hear from me. Great. That's convenient. <laughs> I mean, that is, it actually is hard to um, choose. What, I have a book coming up by uh, Manisha Anantra Rahman, which is uh, all this research she did in uh, Bengaluru in India about sustainability practices between like the upper middle class and then actually like waste pickers. and kind of community activists and a collaboration between those groups and how it transformed their ideas of waste and sustainability. Um, that's just like one, one example. I have another book that's coming out uh, by Sonia Peck about um, like environmental history and history of trauma that has to do with wild spaces that have been reclaimed after wars. 
And to me, that's a really moving and interesting way to connect environmental issues, uh, issues of war and ideas of nature and healing as well. So I am like the worst person to ask this question because I do acquire in lots of different areas and maybe some of the other editors will give you a better sense for really the direction they're moving in. Before I, I came into here, Wade and I were talking and um, the comment I had, and I think I'm gonna, there's a quip, but I think I'll defend it here. Um, I, I think that the most exciting work in the general field for most of the people in this room is where the built environment and environmental work come together and then cease to try and distinguish themselves. Um, and I say this in part because I think that's where things are moving and I think that's exciting. It's an exciting, um, not being interdisciplinary, but actually disintegrating a boundary um, in an interesting way. And my experience at Cornell was that I had a lot of, um, I had a lot of books in urban history that I lost. Him. <laughs> because I wasn't in environmental history. Not a lot. <laughs> I have a count. <laughs> um, and I don't mind losing books to Tim because Tim is a fantastic editor. Oh. Um, and I, when books find a great home, I'm very happy for the oh. author and the books. But in there, 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 I'm sure there are many reasons, but one of them I noticed over time was that I was a not in environmental history. It was really important for these authors to have their work represented in both places. And I wonder if in the course of the next five to 10 years, these organizations will not join for institutional and professional reasons, but intellectually, there'll be one place where this is all happening. And the, those distinctions then will establish sort of rump groups that seem themselves as isolated, but really there's just one thing happening. So work, work, work that takes that distinction and dissolves it in interesting ways, I think, is where things, where I would be excited to see things going. And I think in some sense where things are, in fact, going. Um, let's see here. Um, so I think, if I'm gonna, so I'll just pick one book here, um, about mullet, and not the kind that's in style with <laughs> teenagers. Uh, the fish, right? Uh, so we, so I have a book coming out probably in the next two years about mullet fisheries in Florida, uh, and the the built environment that s sort of supported that industry for a long part of the 20th century, um, which was largely an environment uh, built by poor people, people of color, uh, and then the uh, there's a net ban passed. Uh, late in the 20th century, which was championed by um, conservationists of means, I guess is a polite way to put it. Uh, people who had a um, sort of vested interest in the Florida coastline being something other than a place where working class people could make a living. Okay, uh, And so what this author has done, uh, in addition to sort of oral history, is, is paint a picture of conservationists uh, and environmentalism and its cost for people who aren't rich, right? Uh, taking a, a small fish uh, as sort of the focal point of, of that of that argument, and it's going to be a really cool book if I do say so myself. That does sound super cool. <laughs> um, it, it's an interesting question because all of us are thinking on multiple timescales, right? The books that are coming out right now and that are new to you are so old to us. <laughs> right? And they're still great, and we love them, and we're glad that they're happening, right? But we're talking to people with proposals whose books aren't going to come out for four or five years, right? Um, in some cases. Sometimes faster. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, sort of to pick up on how, how Michael was characterizing it, you know, we publish a lot of urban history, political history, history of capitalism, but the, the books that are most interesting are the ones that are tangential to those and that they are enriching those and are, and are feeding sort of new conversations. Uh, so for example, um, uh, Pat Nugent is writing a, an environmental history of Staten Island. Um, and, a, and I just count that as one. That's one, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that I picked purely at random. <laughs> Um, and a, but a big piece of his argument is, is how 
you know, one, to look at who owns the land on Staten Island, and one of the major answers is the Catholic Church. Um, so that's interesting. Um, but his, his larger argument is that there's a history in Staten Island of people using environmental discourse to achieve conservative ends and saying, oh, well, we need to protect this land over here so we can't build low-income housing, right? And the, the way that environmental rhetoric is weaponized is a political story, but is also an environmental story. It's a built environment story. And that kind of multivalent argument is really interesting. Um, I'll mention also Abby Spinak at the Harvard GSD is writing a history of electricity co-ops. And it's kind of a similar thing. It's it starts off sort of optimistic. Hey, the people are getting together. They're going to they're gonna organize their own electricity. And of course, it all gets horribly corrupted and, and deformed by, by the nature of community organizing, but also by the nature of, of, of energy provision. Right? And so it's, it's, working, it's working in these areas, but, but most importantly, it's working ac across them. Um, oh, and I'll, I'll, mention, I'll mention one more. I'm working with a guy who's not a scholar at all. He's just a complete nerd for bricks. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's self-taught, he's a middle school teacher in Chicago, and he just went completely headlong into learning everything you could possibly know about the bricks of Chicago, and put together this, this just completely stunning book proposal of what the history of Chicago looks like if all you look at is the bricks. <laughs> um, I can't wait, I can't wait for that one. <laughs> Excellent, do we have other questions? Yes. Um, this is a part that I was surprised to hear about the identities that you talked about with the different publishers. Um, with so much of the science is going towards interdisciplinary approaches, um, what what are some of the benefits to the different identities? How can authors take advantage of that? So the question is about I the identities of the presses and what does this bring to the author? What's the moral of the story here? Some of it, I mean, identity is going back to development theory and world economics. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's a comparative advantage, right? I mean, you can't be good at everything. I mean, the bigger the press, there is the possibility, like Oxford, we won't point even to Chicago, we'll point at, but I mean, the bigger the press, the greater the possibility that one could potentially be good, um, be a self-sufficient empire um, at all these things. Most of us are not that big and don't have that capacity. So we need to figure out what we do well and continue to do it, export it, <laughs> import other things, right? Um, so some of it is just the, the nature of in institutions um, having to define themselves and be limited by resources and staffing and what have you. Um, and maybe it all begins there, uh, or maybe it begins with a mission um, in terms of an identity. But somewhere along the line, necessity does become mission and you become known for certain things and you do them well and you attract more and it builds on itself and it becomes part of the culture of the institution. Um, and it is a way for, so that's a short and probably deeply flawed analysis of how institu publishing institutions identify their identities and their list. From your perspective as an author, um, you don't care about where it came from. And you probably don't even care a whole lot where it's going after a decade. But in this critical moment, you want to identify yourself in the academic marketplace as a certain type of person. And the press's identity is going to help you label yourself in ways that you should make helpful and useful to you. And this is another way in which series really help. Because series amplify that, right? You're with MIT, but you're then in a particular series at MIT. and that shows you in your world to be a particular sort of person who is already pre-approved, right? Like you're in the TSA, like you're going through because you, you know, you've been sort of double vetted, right? Um, and, and that shows a whole group of people who take that merit merit meritocracy concept very seriously that you're legit and that can be really useful to you. That's one take. Yes.
So the question is about translated works. Beth, do you take yeah. translated works? Yeah. Um, we like looking for translated works. So I'll just say that, you know, I have colleagues going to Frankfurt next week. Um, I have done a fair number of translations from the French and from the German, and they can be incredibly rewarding and there can be great reasons to do it. There are serious um, financial hurdles that have to be, you know, jumped over <laughs> with a lot of space. So, Translation is very expensive, as it should be. That's important work, and those people earn an like a, a living wage. Um, and frankly, the PNL, like the the budgets that we create for these books, tend to be quite tight as it is. And sure, there are subsidies and grants that exist for translations, but you can't apply for those until you've already signed a contract for a book. And frankly, they're competitive, and you may not get it. So when you're having these conversations with your colleagues in, in finance and design and you know all the rest and sales, of course, importantly, you have to be, they have to be excited enough about the book to take the risk on the finances. Um, so it is a complicated process. Uh, sometimes it works out. Uh, MIT does pride itself in trying to do a fair number of translations. We think it's important, especially in, in, in some disciplines in particular. Uh, on the flip side, because I couldn't hear the whole question, we also, and most presses have a whole rights department and they shop around our books, right, to publishers for translation in other languages. And, you know, that's, that's an important part of disseminating scholarship as well, from our perspective. We want our books to be in as many languages around the world as possible. And um, yeah, we have a staff dedicated to doing that. Um, just to clarify, are you translating the book? Okay, so you're, you, you would be coming at this like an author. Yeah. Okay, well, that actually helps a lot. <laughs> um, because, because we're not then involving a third party who's, do, who's doing this work. Um, I mostly agree with what Beth said. Um, one additional challenge is peer review. Um, you know, you want this under contract at an early stage because it's a huge commitment of time and effort. But when something is written in a language that's not English, you need to find peer reviewers who can read it and write a report in English. Right? And I did a project translated from the Icelandic once, um, and it luckily lots of people in Iceland speak English. Um, but there was a you know, that's, it narrows the pool significantly to find the people whose judgment you trust, who speak both languages, and have the subject matter knowledge to, to be able to say something useful about it. Um, and so as a result, it can take longer uh, to get through that process. Yeah, um, and I'll just add for your, for your particular circumstance um, that it would be, as you approach presses, one of the first questions they're gonna ask you is, do you know if the English language look, rights for this are available? Yeah. Right. So you should figure out who you know who published the um, whatever your whatever language you're translating it from, right? And if they still have the rights, if the author retained the rights, if the author's no longer alive, right? If their estate has, the, you know what I mean? So you doing a little bit of that legwork up front will make it for us, at, or me at least. I shouldn't speak. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's how we did establish the rights. Okay, good. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Michael, are you in agreement? Uh, Shweta, uh, let's see. Catherine, did you have a question? Oh, no, somebody else was there. Um, okay, so let me just to make sure that we cover all our, our subjects and we'll, re, we'll keep these questions. So um, I just would like to ask Nate a little bit to reflect on the difficulties, which are many, of taking your dissertation and moving into a book. Oh, dissertation to book books, yeah. Um, 
Okay, so I guess I guess the way I'll start this is a, is a little story from a recent experience that I had. So I had someone approach me with a proposal, a pretty good proposal, um, uh, that I read, and we we started a conversation about it, um, and it got to I don't know a second second Zoom conversation, and it turns out that they had not defended their dissertation yet, right? Uh, and I didn't know that because the the proposal had made no mention of the dissertation, right? Um, that it came from a dissertation, that it was, you know, uh, based on that. And so, you know, I, I asked, I asked the the author, like, you know, so what was your what was your thought process here? And I will say that I'm, he has since defended, and we're moving forward. So this didn't torpedo anything. But um, I said, what's, what was the thought process about like not mentioning that this came from a dissertation? And there's a um, which I should mention, a very good book called The Book Proposal Book from Princeton University Press by Laura Portwood Stacer, uh, who also sort of runs a, she's a developmental editor consultant uh, with a web presence, who recommends explicitly that if, if you don't have to, um, if you think you can get away with proposing a book and not mentioning that it's a dissertation, then you shouldn't mention it, right? Um, which, okay. I, I, that makes me feel uncomfortable, right? It makes me feel like you're hiding something from me because right. the the notion is that editors don't want dissertation to book books, which is, to use a technical term, bull, bull BS. Okay, <laughs> um, it's it's part it's part of how we do our jobs. Some of the best books, award-winning books that we publish, come from dissertations. One of our top five bestsellers was a dissertation to book book, right? In the last five years, um, what? What we need to, what I need to know as an editor for a dissertation to book book is that you have considered how your dissertation is going to be different from the book because it's going to be different for any number of reasons. But the most important reason is audience, right? You're writing the dissertation for three to five people who have to read it, okay? <laughs> and sometimes they don't even read it. Um, uh, you're writing the book for hopefully a much wider audience. Even if it sells 200 copies, that's quite a few uh, more eyes than five, uh, five sets of eyes anyways. Um, so audience is important, right? And the other thing that I'll say is that for better or worse, the nature of academic publishing is that the folks who are gonna be reviewing your proposal or manuscript are expecting what you are turning your dissertation into to be different from your dissertation, right? Uh, that's sort of the, the, nature of, the nature of how it works. And so you need to show that you have thought about how that's gonna happen. And you should probably be thinking about it as you are writing your dissertation, right? Because part of the, the goal of a dissertation is to defend it and get your PhD, right? It's not to turn it into a book immediately. Um, and you know there are really good books about how to do that. The the one I always send people to is William Germano's from Dissertation to Book, which is a Chicago book, um, and that has really he uses a lot of metaphors. So there's bound to be one that <laughs> that resonates with you. Um, and and in your proposal, so in, in UGA Press's proposal guidelines, there's a section called uh, Plan for Completion. I always tell Dissertation to Book folks that that is the section where you need to show what you were doing or what you were planning to do. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess the, the moral of the story is don't hide it and embrace the, embrace the revision that is, that is necessary um, and that we mm -hmm. want dissertation to book books. Anyway. Shweta? Mm -hmm. So please avoid my not knowing the proposal because I don't know the proposal. So I want to know when you accept a proposal and when you are ready to accept it and go to strike for the proposal, how do you decide the economics about it? How many copies to print? Who will find it? What the author will take from that? And if there are a future process, take all that economics. And I'm sorry if I don't know. I know that these university presses in the scholar, you know. Non All right, so this, this question is about the economics of the project, which is something that most of the authors don't know enough about, but 
Beth, do you want to say something? Uh, it, it varies a lot by book type. Um, scholarly monographs have dropped in sales significantly over the past 10 years, and that has to do with the way that libraries buy books because they are the primary uh, market for those. So that usually means also that presses are, at least you know, MIT is moving towards shorter print runs because we can do quicker reprints. Um, inevitably, when you, it's just, you know, basic math of you do print fewer books, the cost per book goes up. And so that impacts the economics of the book. And it usually can mean that the price of the book maybe goes up. Um, at MIT Press to combat this cycle, because we do want our books to be easily purchased by individuals, we actually publish all of our books, scholarly books, open access. We have a separate program called Direct to Open, which is a library subscription program, institutional sales. And so we're depending on libraries to buy our you know, ebook collections. And then we can use that money towards the PL, like the, the economics, the finances of individual books. Um, when you have higher print runs, because you think that there's a larger market, and this again goes back to comparables, uh, intended market, and everybody, all of my colleagues in sales and marketing. Um, agreeing to this, then you have a larger print run, and then you can really play with the price, and you're really making sure you're being competitive in any of these situations with the other books in the market that are similar to you, because ultimately the readers are making a choice. They can buy your book, or maybe there are a few other books out there that they could buy, and it would be worthwhile for their scholarship to read, and maybe price will influence that purchase too. So um, yeah, I could go on about this, even though it's boring and contentious, <laughs> but I'll let others speak. It does go back to the importance of, of picking good comparables in your proposal. You know, they, need, they, need to be, they need to work on a substantive level, but we have the ability to see at least some portion of other publishers' sales. There are databases out there that, that we subscribe to. It's not perfect, but we can, we can get a sense of, oh, yeah, that one did pretty well, or wow, nobody bought that, right? And, we don't expect you to know that. You don't need to do that kind of research. But it, it, it does influence what we do. We say, you know, this is really interesting. It's got all kinds of, of you know, rich work in it. And it's very much like these other books that sold 100 copies, right? It's like, that doesn't mean we're not going to do it, right? But it does mean that we, need, we can't start at the premise that it's going to sell huge numbers, right? We have to, we have to figure out a way to make it work within its likely universe. Right. We'd love to be proved wrong about these things. <laughs> but <laughs> and, and building on that, I just want to say something that's going to sound a little perverse, but actually takes a burden off of many people in the room, is that the monograph market, the typical revised dissertation for influencing a particular scholarly discourse, has gotten so bad that we can publish any book. It used to be, and I think, I think this is where Laura's thinking, because I, I, think, I think her guidance in that book is, is dated in yeah. certain respects, yeah. that I think her guidance came from about seven or eight years ago when we thought every academic book needed to cross over. We want to make every academic book speak to a general audience in addition to nailing down its core academic audience. And you know what? It just did not work at all. Uh -huh. um, and one, we tortured, we tortured first time authors to open up their books to every person because we thought we could do that and we priced them in weird, strange ways and packaged them in weird, strange ways. And none of that really worked. And we're now down to this because like we're a successful first book will probably sell as its own self about 200 copies in the first year, 250. And then we see more income from the aggregator market, Muse, JSTOR, what have you. That's where the cash is coming from. So the expectations now are that you're filling a need within the, the discipline, we're getting you into the aggregators, you're gonna make income, you're not gonna break even, and we figured out the economics, that, and the economics are really dismal, but we figured it out, and the burden on you as an author for a first time book of a typical book, really, I don't think you have an economic burden. You have a burden to prove substance and relevance to fit in marketplace and an intellectual marketplace ideas and how we package it. You may not like the price of your book, <laughs> um, but we, we figured out the economics of it in our own peculiar and, as always, not entirely successful way at this point. But the marketplace has changed such that Laura's advice, I think, is dated. Yeah, we, um, we turned down that book. <laughs> so you don't have to say anything in the proposal about like what that. you think the yeah, economics yeah. will. It's not your job. 
All you have to show is you know, this is a good project and these are the comparables, but you're not being asked to determine the price. It's just not your problem. Can I add one more thing that might be relevant to this crowd? So some of the books that you might want to publish may have more illustrations than the, the kind of book that I generally publish. And so that is a case where if you're looking for more illustrations or if you need a color section or something like that, then you might need to find funds. Maybe, maybe your department has funds for a subvention, like $5,000, like it might vary. And that's a case when the press would want to know if you can support the production of your book. Yeah, that, good point. That, that is very important. And often, you know about resources. Sometimes there are uh, foundations that will apply to on, on your behalf um, to try to get support. Um, you know, those, there are lots of different ways to find the money necessary to do the kind of book necessary. But the, the key word there, of course, is necessary, right? How much is the color doing, right? Does it really have to be oversized, what, what, what you're doing? Does it have to have a fold out, honestly? Um, you know, and in some cases, the answer is yes, it needs all those things, right? I'm, I'm doing a book that's going to be out next year that is, uh, it's going to be about 10 by 8 rectangular, and it's going to fold out to 11 feet long, okay? because that's what it has to be. Um, and so that presents a certain number of production challenges and it needs all kinds of resources, but if you don't do it that way, it's not going to exist at all, right? Most cases, that's not what we're talking about, right? And do you need 60 color images to, to make your case? Maybe. Could you do it with 20? Maybe. Could you do it with a mix of color in black and white? Probably. Um, you know, so working those things out is also an important part of this. Your question? Yeah. Um, thanks. I was uh, just wondering how um, the pandemic may have changed your uh, sense of what was relevant to the marketplace of ideas. Uh, it has really academic ideas. Pretty slow, but has this, have you seen this change at all in your perception of where the field is going? So the question is about the influence of the pandemic. <laughs> no one's thought about I, this. Well, so one, a, a kind of book that we turn down a lot, and often with some degree of regret, but nevertheless, um, is something that's trying to be too current. I, I mean, I think, I think lots of presses have a COVID book or a Ukraine book or something like that, right? But we don't chase headlines, right? It's just we're not set up to do it. It just takes, our process takes too long, right? And so I think to the extent that those things are affecting fields, right. I mean, are, are, are people going to be studying, uh, I don't know, nuclear war more than, than they were last year? They might be. Is that going to manifest in uh, more books and more book proposals over the next few years? possibly, um, and we'll evaluate that as that work starts to emerge. But we're responding to what's happening in the field, right? It's not, it's not that we have, a, it's not like we're going out and saying, quick, get me a book on the Ukraine, right? Because, uh, just in terms of authors, we have like, older comfortables because they've been stuck, their research has been stopped during the pandemic. Oh, 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 oh. Is that, is that seen as a, as a well, I mean, we all went through the pandemic, right? I mean, so, you know, I, I can't tell you how many authors have come to me and said, my archives were closed. I'm like, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there are some books that have um, author's notes that pertain to closed archives. The book needed to be finished, and, and it was clear that there were resources that were there and that were necessary and were inaccessible, and for reasons of life circumstances or what have you, the work needed to be completed. So there, there is the pandemic archival caveat that a few of my books have. Um, um, but uh, just thinking about writing and topics and all that, I mean, an author, um, Manhattan Borough historian Robert Snyder is doing a book on COVID New York City. And it's a lot of oral histories and what have you. And we just had this last conversation before I left. You know, they come, you're leaving me. 
I'm pissed, so what are we going to do? Um, and you know, you're describing what's going on, and he said the big change in that book, and this is this is the underlying the risk of chasing the present or writing the history of the present, is that you know when I when I conceptualized this, I thought that Black Lives Matter would be a really important story to the COVID New York City story. Now on two years reflection, it's actually it's there, but it's not in the center where he thought it was. So. You know, that's the exciting thing about doing a book that takes into account the very present tense. And so long as you're comfortable with revising yourself and you're, un you're comfortable with that uncertainty. But if you're looking to be more definitive, as some scholars want to be, there's a gigantic risk. Because um, the, the present and the next tomorrow is going to kick your butt um, in ways that you may not find pleasant. All right. This bad boy with uh, so this is about this specific book published by the University yeah. of Georgia Press with Thousands 750, of, I think, yeah, photos. almost a thousand color images. Um, so the University of Georgia, and if you flip it on the back. Um, you can't see it from there, but there's a little logo here that says a Wormslow Foundation nature book. Mm. Okay, so for everybody's in Georgia now. So Wormslow is what is now no longer called a plantation, but a plantation on the Georgia coast um, that the same family who the king deeded the land to in the 18th century, 17th century, still owns it. Um, and so that family is pretty involved with all sorts of UGA stuff, including donating money to the press. So we, so in this particular case, um, we had a, a pot of money available to not only produce the book, but to make it available for a price that people could actually afford. Um, and the, you know, and so we have lots of internal meetings about what what books we're going to use that use that money on, what books maybe we're not going to use that money. Right. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into deciding what books get to use, get to use what money. Um, but that's the only way that, that this happened, right? And this is a book that is in, the idea when we decided to do it is that it would be in like a um, garden store, right? And it is, and people have, have bought it for that reason. Um, so, so yeah, there is, and that, that again, that as we've been saying, I think is, I guess, the theme of every single one of these panels I've ever been on is, depends on the press, mm -hmm. right? Some presses have, have those sorts of things for, like, this just so happened that these are two UGA professors, right, college design, design professors, that we have a fund dedicated to books about the environment, mm -hmm. right, and the Southeast, which this is, right? So if they were writing this about Pacific Northwest landscape design, that we wouldn't have been the people. What was the list price on Yeah, uh, and I, I regretfully, okay, so we have two questions and this will probably be the end. No, yeah. don't do that. Yeah, okay, doesn't matter. Uh -huh. I'm wondering if you want to recommend taking multiple different articles that have related data sets um, and so how would that process work? How to describe it to your articles or different articles? I have a number of articles. Okay. 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 So how to integrate several articles in a book, if possible? <laughs> Beth? Beth, are you going to be more positive than I am? <laughs> that's a tough, tough question. Uh, that's, that's, it's a tough question. Yeah, that's fine. I'll take that role. That's fine. Um, so one, one chapter based on a published article I can work with um, and better be substantially revised and really play a part in the larger argument. But more than that, um, it just doesn't especially if it's scholarly monograph, it doesn't work because the readers of your article likely are the same readers of your book. So what are they, you know, there can't be too much repeated information there. Otherwise, really, what are they getting? Yeah, it, it, 
it's, it's all about access, right? If, if, if your ideal readers can already access your information, then the book project has to do something really different, right? And even if you could, you, you can use the same data set, you could, you know, but you have to pull a different book out of it. Um, because the last thing you want is someone to come across your book and say, oh yeah, I know what she thinks, right? Because then that does nobody any good. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Last question? Yeah, so um, I just want to ask how open communication possibilities in the US are towards publishing niche uh, subjects. Like I work for a state health So if I'm working for a book around that, should I make it more global? Is it okay if it's very niche? Is it one aspect? So if, if you feel that your topic is very niche, in this case, Northeast India, something about uh, how to make it interesting to a major press. I mean, we publish niche stuff all the time, right? It's just a matter of finding a press that publishes stuff in that, in that sort of niche, right? And that's not to say that niche means that it's navel gazing, right? That you're just looking at that for that particular, uh, for what you can learn about that particular place it would you know it's always good if you're writing um, what I call a micro history right if you're writing something about a specific place that you can that we're learning something broader right but it, I don't I don't think you have to again I'm speaking about UGA press specifically or me specifically even uh, it doesn't have to have global importance for it to be important I think something that said regarding comparables carries over here in terms of analogy, which is, you know, you don't want to oversell your book with your comps. You don't want to oversell your topic by, you know, this province in global context, where really that's just a rhetorical move, but it's not based in anything. And I guess, you know, place, locality, it's either synecdoche, right? You, you, you're, you're in here, but it shows something bigger not by necessarily situating in a larger data set, but just that it reflects, you, you can see the big and the small, or you make the small so fascinating in and, uh, and our anthropologists, of course, are you know, both notorious and famous for this. You know, they, 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 they take the specific and they make it so compelling that in an immersive writing ex experience, or rather reading experience, um, you don't, the reader does not care that it is niche or it's small, but indeed the power of it comes from its specificity and its smallness. So, and, and, and those are, I think, two poles, synecdoche or you know, the compelling nature of the specific, and there are places along that continuum. Um, but, but overselling with a rhetorical move with a flashy subtitle that you can't back up, <laughs> I mean, we're all gonna figure that out pretty soon. <laughs> I, I would just add, Quickly, when, next time you go to a professional conference and there's a book exhibit, um, look at it critically. Don't just go in and say, hey, we, we, I, I could buy books, right? I mean, that's great, do that. But, but step back at each booth and sort of say, could I see my book here? What are they showing? Why did they put those books on the banner? Why are those books on the front table? You know, and you can learn things. You might be surprised by what you see in some places, you know, for, for good or for ill. Um, but if you, if you look at a, a display in your field and think, I could totally be there, then, you know, you're probably on the right track. On this positive note. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for uh, being here, and uh, let's give a round of applause for our speakers here.